Hello, everyone. I'm Brian Carrington, and you're listening to Call Talk for March 19th, 2014. Today's topic is a good one and on everyone's mind, managing virtual agents. So if you're listening live, I'd like to invite you to be a part of the show and ask questions, and here's how you can do it. There's two different ways. Probably the best is email me at brian at benchmarkportal.com, and that's spelled out B-R-I-A-N at benchmarkportal.com, or if you're listening live on the phone or close to one, you can always call in. Here's the number to do that, 347 857 Three one one seven. Again, real quick, three four seven eight five seven three one one seven. But make sure to press the number one on your phone to let me know that you have a question, and I'll get you in. I also want to remind everyone that all of our shows are archived and available to listen to any time of the day or night that's convenient for you at our website, at benchmarkportal.com. So without further ado, let's jump into the show. I'd like to introduce the host of Call Talk, Bruce Belfiore. Thank you, Brian, and welcome back to Call Talk, everyone. Today's topic is on managing virtual agents. And our first show on virtual agents was uh, five years ago, and it continues to be a hot issue, and people are still trying to confront the issue and and try to solve some of the problems and issues that it uh, brings up uh, even now. And I think that's going to continue for some time uh, forward. So uh, questions come up like, can home agent programs increase employee loyalty? Can they reduce turnover? Can they decrease costs and streamline things while ensuring a high-quality customer experience? More and more call centers are looking at home-based agents as a way of providing an improved work experience for employees while also helping to improve their bottom line. So a few areas that we hope to discuss today include how to complement your current model, blending home and in-office agents, uh, the importance of an organization-wide support to ensure collaboration so that a at-home agent program works, and also to have a clear definition right off the bat of the distinction between home-based office, uh, a home-based agents and office agents. So for this, we brought in an expert on the topic for you, Mr. Jesse Hubler. Hello, everyone. Okay. Jesse is the Director of Worldwide Software Support at Pitney Bowes, a $5 billion company that provides technology solutions for small, mid-sized, and large firms, and it helps them to connect with customers to build loyalty and grow revenue. And since he's been at Pitney Bowes, Jesse has been on a five-year journey to transform the support organization into an award-winning business service, driving excellence through customer experience. He focuses on customer adoption and realized value, And his support organization has seen some dramatic improvement in customer satisfaction and loyalty. Prior to joining Pitney Bowes, Jesse led the support organization at Chronicle Technologies, which is an industry leader in management software for the restoration and construction industry. And during his tenure there, he virtualized Chronicle Support Center, cutting costs and driving efficiency gains through a 100% work-from-home agent model. So Jesse brings a lot of experience to this discussion. Uh, We're really delighted to have you here, Jesse. Thanks a lot, Bruce. It's great to be here. Okay. So Jesse, why do home-based agents continue to be such a hot topic in call centers these days? As you mentioned, it's been a hot topic for a while. Um, it's, It's definitely an exciting time to be in business, and depending on who you ask, they might say it's a scary time to be in business. The rate of change within business is astounding. Companies aren't just looking at best practice, but they're also trying to define new practice. And there's a convergence of trends that are happening that really make virtual call centers and home-based agents particularly appealing and vital to business nowadays. The first is productivity versus cost. So, Bruce, how many times have you heard the do more with less motto over the past couple of years? Well, Jesse, I'd say that term is uh, that's sort of the industry anthem these days. This is what we always hear. Uh, please give me better and more and uh, try to do it with less resources and money. So, yeah, I hear you on that. Absolutely. You know, businesses are increasingly looking to improve their productivity while also trying to drive down costs. There's a polarity between these two competing interests that really demands that business leaders think in new and creative ways. 
How are you able to build your business to ensure you're pushing the envelope when it comes to productivity and efficiency gains, but also keeping a close eye on costs? The home-based agent program helps navigate that divide and deliver on both productivity and cost. The second major area is the dynamic technology aspects. Business technology is re reinventing how and where we do business. We are ultra-connected to each other and to our customers. And by leveraging this new technology, we're able to harness greater gains in efficiency, collaboration, and customer insight. The improvement in technology really makes home-based agents more realistic now than ever. The third major area is the changing employee. How employees want to work and expect to work are dramatically changing. Employees that come out of high school and college play by a different set of rules, and if businesses are able to adapt to this new dynamic, amazing things can happen. Yeah, no, that's a great point because really uh, people these days are used to carrying around their means of communication with them, and they don't see, since they're able to uh, respond to friends and respond to uh, associates, et cetera, from wherever they are, uh, you know, why can't this be done as part of their work uh, environment as well? So there's, uh, I think, a big push that helps out the trend that you're describing and you've become a, an expert on. Uh, by the way, I, I'd like to mention that Greg Van Zant uh, did a an earlier show, not not too much earlier than this one, uh, on Gen X, Gen Y, and some of the challenges that call center managers face in managing them. And in fact, uh, if you have a real grasp of those special qualities of the millennials, Gen X, Gen Y, then, then you can probably implement one of these programs even better. What, what, what do you think about that, Jesse? Absolutely. I would tend to agree with you. And I'd also say it even goes beyond just looking at the new millennials, because there's a whole new stream of potential workers in the marketplace that have previously been untapped due to their inability to work traditional nine to five jobs in the office. But they can definitely be utilized in a virtual call center model working from home. Mm -hmm. So the fourth area is definitely in terms of customer expectations. So we, we talked about the dynamic around changing employee expectations, but customer expectations are changing as well. Your customers are asking for more than they've ever asked from your business. And if you're not able to give it to them, they're not afraid to leave you and bring a hundred of their closest friends. You're, they're judging your service, rightly or wrongly, against the last best service that they received from companies like Amazon, Zappos, Apple. Now, you might say, that's not fair, in my, they're not in my industry, uh, but customers don't care. To them, it's all about service. And if you're not delivering to these high standards that these other companies are, your customers will not be forgiving to you. So mm -hmm. these business trends aren't going away. If anything, they're hardening into the fundamental bedrock of business as usual. The home-based agent model helps deliver on these convergence of four trends. Yeah, really. The, the whole idea of having excellent customer service anytime, from anywhere, uh, through any channel uh, is, is a big challenge for customer contact industry uh, managers. And uh, really having a distributed workforce uh, that's able to be more flexible in terms of meeting the demands, I was going to say the needs, but in some cases it's not even the needs. It's the demands of the uh, marketplace of what they, they want to have uh, is, uh, you know, a, a great thing when you, you consider it in, in light of the at-home uh, agent model. Well, let me ask you this, Jesse. What are some of the tangible benefits of a virtual agent program? Well, uh, you ask 100 people, you'll probably get 100 different answers. So, so there's quite a few, Bruce. But to tell you the truth, I, I can tell you some of the reasons why uh, the virtual agents and work-from-home program have worked for me in my current company and, and previous companies that I've worked for. Um, I'd say one of the first is what I call the shrinking office. Um, real estate's expensive, and uh, – for companies to be able to cut costs and be as efficient and effective as possible, they want to try to minimize their physical office location footprint. And the call center with 1,000 agents, 5,000 agents can definitely cause a headache when it comes to large geographic office locations. So moving to a home-based agent program really helps shrink that office and get your real estate costs under control. So that's one big ROI for implementing a virtual agent program. 
The second, I'd say, is around redundancy and, and disaster recovery. So uh, if you have all of your agents in one geographic location and you have a massive snowstorm like we often do up here in the northeast where I am, you're, you're in pretty big trouble if your agents can't get online and answer the phone calls or emails that your customers are calling in about. And if you have a virtual or work-from-home agent program where you have agents distributed throughout the United States or even overseas, then you have that built-in disaster recovery and you can reroute the calls from that down office to this distributed network to be able to he help keep your operations running. The third mm -hmm. major one, I would say, is language support. So uh, you need to speak your customer's language, not just metaphorically, but their actual language. And I'd say that one of the best ways to be able to get multilingual talent is to hire where you can find that multilingual talent. If your geographic office that's physically located someplace doesn't have the best talent pool for multilingual speakers, look someplace else and bring those multilingual speakers on that can speak the language of your customers to be able to provide better service to them. And it really broadens your talent pool to the entire U.S. rather than just looking in one geographic location. The fourth, Bruce, I'd say is uh, employee selection. So it kind of hinges on the last one around language support, but even looking broader than that, you're able to pick from the best people, not just the people that are 10 minutes or 30 minutes from your office. Uh, people like your super fans. So no matter what industry you're in, whether you're healthcare, insurance, uh, or computer technology, there are people who love your product. Wouldn't it be amazing to be able to recruit them and have them work in your support organization. Uh, recruiting your super fans is a great way to drive customer loyalty because it's one person who loves your product talking to another person that may not love your product at that point in time. It, it really provides for a better conversation. Uh, the second is um, different types of uh, workforce like work from home moms. So people who can't traditionally work in the nine to five office setting location and may need to work different shifts have the ability to work in a virtual agent program. Um, and the third is an untapped talent pool of retirees, those who are disabled or, or veterans that may not be able to go into the office. You can pull from a really high quality talent pool that you may not be able to tap into if you're strictly looking at people that can come into your office. Mm. Yeah, so you're really uh, widening the, uh, the net, if you will, of uh, potential people here and, and pulling in some people who have particular attributes that you're looking for, the super fans I can see definitely, uh, these other people that you're talking about, probably highly motivated to, uh, to do well and to uh, succeed as uh, contact center agents. So I, I think that's a great I idea. And, you know, one of the other things, Jesse, is we did a uh, study of call center agents uh, that included over 5,000 uh, surveys from agents. And one of the things we asked them was how far do you commute to work each day, and uh, it went anywhere from between one and ten minutes all the way to uh, over one hour, and then those who telecommute. And we did a correlation analysis, uh, Jesse, with their satisfaction index. And it was very interesting because it's a very clear um, trend, that is to say the shorter your commute, the happier you are. People who have more than an hour commute tend to be the least happy of all, and you can kind of understand that, right? The most happy by far, statistically very, very relevant, were those who telecommute. So yep. if you need some statistical backup uh, to say, okay, overall, uh, who are your happiest agents? Overall, your happiest agents are the ones that don't have to commute at all and who are actually working from home. There's nothing better than waking up in a snowstorm and knowing that your commute from your bedroom to your home office is only about 10 steps. <laughs> that's right. And that's been happening an awful lot lately, hasn't it? Uh, too much, too much. <laughs> too much, too much. Yeah, from your perch there in Upper New York State, uh, you can really appreciate it. And for our friends listening from Canada, this is uh, also uh, very relevant for you guys as well. Okay, well, you know, let, let's think about this. It all sounds great, Jesse, but I've been reading also that there's some, some companies like Yahoo and Best Buy, uh, they're actually tightening or eliminating their work-from-home programs. This isn't just for call center agents, but just in general, uh, sort of pulling people back to the bricks and mortar, getting them back in the office where they can interact with their colleagues, et cetera, et cetera. 
Uh, why are some of those people pulling back? That's a great question, Bruce. And, you know, I'd say you need to clearly understand what a virtual agent program is and what it isn't. You can't think of the virtual agent program as the silver bullet to solve all the world's business problems. And you really need to go into it eyes wide open to make sure that you understand what you're hoping to expect to get out of it. And are you able to really see that return on investment? I'd, I'd strongly recommend for people who are in that camp of not really sure whether to implement a work from home or virtual program, try out a small pilot. Pick five or ten of your best employees or employees that you think will be able to move into a home-based program and try a small pilot rather than going in the deep end. I'd say that's the best way to go to make sure that you're getting the return on investment that you're expecting. And if, if you're not, then tweak the program or, or go back to the drawing board to analyze, is it really the right approach for your business? So there's, there's certainly hurdles you need to navigate in order to make sure the program's successful. Mm. Yeah, no, I think that, that sounds all like uh, wise input there. Any program, really, that's going to be as important and as serious as this uh, needs to be very, very carefully uh, constructed, uh, very carefully monitored as you go through it, ready to make adjustments, et cetera. And, and actually, let me just ask you in general for a little spoiler alert here. <laughs> um, you know, what are some of the hurdles that you've seen uh, that businesses need to be aware of and uh, that people listening to this program can maybe jot down so that they have a little heads up on on things because we always want to make sure that these programs are are very useful to call center managers and actually will give them specific pieces of advice that they can use in uh, in doing their own planning. Absolutely, that makes a lot of sense. So uh, I've seen quite a few and I've navigated quite a few. I'm I'm happy to. Uh, talk about my story and uh, hopefully help others avoid some of those uh, those trickier parts of navigating through a virtual agent program. I- I'd say the first is collaboration. Um, you know, collaboration will suffer if you don't explicitly address it. There's something to be said for having everybody in one office and having them be able to lean over the cubicle to ask a question to a colleague. When you're in a virtual program you don't have that natural collaboration. Uh, So you have to look at how you can morph that collaboration into ways to allow for agents to talk to one another, agents to talk to their supervisors and, and talk to their managers to be able to still get the same results and still collaborate, but in new and unique ways. And I'd say technology is an accelerator for that type of collaboration. So it's not the answer. Just because you put in a good piece of technology that, uh, that, that says it will help collaborate together with your team better doesn't mean that that's going to happen. It's really looking at what that technology do, can do to help accelerate the collaboration opportunities that you're putting forth on your team. So definitely try to address collaboration in a very upfront and focused way because if you don't address it explicitly, it's going to bury you. The second is your traditional managers and supervisors aren't ready. So if you think you can simply roll out an a, a virtual agent program without doing anything for your managers or your supervisors, you're going to be headed for some big trouble. Just because you have good people managers doesn't mean you've got the, they've got the skill set needed to run a virtual team. So what I tended to see was, especially in junior managers, there's one of two extremes. Those junior managers are going to micromanage the virtual team. They don't trust what they can't see. And so they're going to try to micromanage that virtual team, and and that's not good for anybody. The second extreme is if they don't micromanage, they'll probably try to ignore that virtual team and focus all of their efforts on agents that are in the office. So you want to make sure that you are not only addressing the work from home program from an employee perspective or an agent perspective, but you also definitely want to give uh, good training and and select the right managers who will be good running virtual teams. And my my piece of advice there would be try to start out by – by selecting managers that can run a blended team. So having team members who are both in the office and remote, 
uh, and see how they do. And don't be afraid to poll the employees and, and do an employee engagement survey, both for the in-office employees and home-based employees, and see the results of that to see how the manager is effective or ineffective based on that. So those are two of the major attributes that I'd say uh, that, that you need to be careful of is the collaboration and, and you know, your manager's readiness to be able to run a virtual team. Mm, those are good. Are there any others that you, you'd add to that? Yeah, yeah, I think that uh, the next one would probably be around metrics. So you really need to take a hard look at your metrics and, and understand what you're measuring and, and what you're not. Because when it comes to metrics, uh, you know, people do what they're incentivized to do and, and what metrics that you look at. So definitely, I'd say, make sure that your metrics are producing the right behaviors that you're hoping to achieve not just from your home agents, but from your in-office agents. And, and so as you start looking at implementing a work-from-home program, definitely take the time to analyze your metrics to see in a virtual program, am I going to be getting the right behaviors that people may naturally uh, tend to gravitate to from in-office employees? And well, of course, the fourth that's... Uh... That's music to our ears here at Benchmark Portal because we, we really do believe in the metrics and uh, how important they can be, but the fact that they have to be used the right way and uh, the sort of uh, consequences need to be understood ahead of time so that they're really uh, leveraged uh, to the best possible effect. So, yeah, that's a great point. Sorry, I interrupted you. You were going to go on to another point? Uh, and, and the last one, and I think actually the last one is the most important, is um, – not all agents have the characteristics to make them successful working from home. Employee selection is key. Whether you're hiring on employees specifically to work at home or you're looking at your current talent pool of in-office employees and deciding which ones to push virtual to try that pilot program. Just because you've got a great agent that is great in the office doesn't mean that they'll be able to work from home as successfully. So you really need to look at the right characteristics for your agents to make sure when you're hiring or when you're pushing employees virtual that you're, you're, you're picking the right ones because that's, that's the essentials of, of having the, the best work from home program you can. Right, right. Of course, and there are those situations, too, of people who are equally effective working from home or in the office, but they really don't want to work from home for a variety of reasons. In fact, maybe they're trying to get away from home for one reason or another to and go to the office. So it's a bit of a, a refuge for them, and they're really happier working from the office than they are from home. So that's something that needs to be taken into account with some of your, your workers. Um, you know, if I could ask you to summarize the success criteria for home-based agents, you know, what, what would you look for uh, from an employee perspective? Uh, you know, what should you look for from a, a manager's perspective? If you could kind of put the bow on this discussion and, and give us a, a few more pointers on that, I, I'd appreciate it. Absolutely. Let's, let's first start with the employee. So uh, as I just mentioned and, and as you um, elaborated on, Proper employee selection is key. That's going to make or break your work from home agent program. You need to make sure that you have the right employees. So that's first and foremost. The second is you need to create opportunities for an employee to feel like they're part of the in-office team. They need to feel like they're part of a larger team. Working from home exclusively can feel isolating, and you need to make sure that you're creating those opportunities for connection with the in-office team. Definitely utilize technology for connection and collaboration. But remember that technology isn't the answer. It's simply an accelerant that can help make your work-from-home agent program work even better. But don't try to use technology as the end-all and be-all of solving your work-from-home problems. Uh, the next one is you know, look for opportunities to mix in-office and virtual employees. Look for areas where you can build teams that have some of the team members in the office and some of the team members virtual. It will help make the entire team stronger. And the last one is I'd say definitely survey your employees uh, to ask them how things are going. Are their managers effective? You know, are they enjoying their time working from home? Like you said, you, you can roll out – a virtual agent program, but uh, only some employees will be successful. You need to ask how those employees are doing and then try to take the best practices of the successful work from home employees and roll it out to your entire group. 
So mm-hmm. if we then flip it to the other side and look from a manager perspective, um, as I stated before, not all managers are created equal, especially in a virtual environment. You need to also select the best managers, the managers who have the right characteristics that won't micromanage or won't ignore your virtual teams. Um, make sure that they adopt an everyone is remote mentality for everything. So if they are, are leading a blended team of in in uh, office agents and work from home agents, make sure that they adopt that everyone is remote mentality. That'll help them bridge the gap to make sure that they're, they're not ignoring one part of the population. Um, allow younger managers to have blended teams and, and definitely make sure that they avoid that tendency to micromanage. Um, mm-hmm. And then finally, I'd say, you know, make sure that you, you tune the metrics. And, and like you said, Benchmark Portal is a, a great partner to, to help you analyze the metrics to say, you know, are we looking at the right metrics in order to get the right outcomes from this virtual agent program? Mm-hmm. Okay, all great points. Listen, uh, thank you very much for that, that very complete answer there. And uh, we're getting toward the end of the hour, but we've got a couple of questions that have come in. So I'd like to turn things over to Brian to ask a couple of questions. All right. Thanks, Bruce. Uh, some really good insight there, Jesse. Uh, I'm enjoying this immensely. Uh, and we have some questions coming in an email just a moment ago. And a uh, good, good one here. Uh, are you worried that home-based agents won't be as productive as office-based agents? And that's an email from Fran. Uh, good, good question, Fran. Uh, I'm, I'm asked this quite a bit. Uh, but I always revert back to uh, if you have an unproductive employee – they can be unproductive regardless of where they work. You could have an unproductive employee at home. You could have an unproductive employee in the office. So uh, it, it's, it's not dependent on their geographic location. It, again, it all goes back to hiring the right people, right? So you want to look for a self-starter. You want to look for someone who takes accountability and ownership and has a pride in what they do. Um, it's our all-around employee selection, and, and I wouldn't be too hung up or worried about not being productive in a home-based agent program. It's, it's all about employee selection and focusing on that. Interesting. Uh, we've got a couple more. Bruce, did you want to uh, add anything there? You know what? Uh, I think that uh, we, we, with the time we've got, I'd like to just uh, hear the answers to the questions. So uh, I think that was a great answer. Okay, sounds good. Uh, Here's another one for you, Jesse. This one comes from Carlos. And you kind of touched on the technology component a little earlier in the show, but this is more direct of a question. And Carlos is asking, should you buy technology, I mean the computer or the phone, for the home-based agents, or should you make the agent buy it? That's that's a great question, uh, and and I don't have a, a great answer for it, uh, unfortunately, because um, if you go out and, and ask companies like like I have at uh, different conferences that I've spoken at or or been to, um, different companies have different philosophies on this. So so I've seen companies go both ways. There's and there's benefits to both, right? So if you uh, buy the technology for them, um, you have a common image, a common framework of computer and phone, uh, and it's a lot easier for your IT team to be able to manage that known technology. That, that's definitely helpful. Uh, but then again, um, if they buy it, you, you, you have less risk. You have a lot less risk from, uh, from, from buying the technology because if they leave the program or they, they leave the company, uh, you're not losing out on, on any of the technology you purchased for them. So uh, there's definitely less risk and less cost for you if they buy it themselves. How, Can I just ask, ask there, is it, is, is it possible to, for instance, uh, specify what they have to buy? Say that you have to buy it, uh, but this is what you have to buy. Can you do that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So if you're if you're in the camp where you'd like them to purchase it, you can de- definitely develop the, the correct framework uh, and say, here's the, the specs of the computer that you're going to need to get. Here's the type of phone you're going to need to get. Here's the, the Internet speed that you'll need if you have voice over IP for your phone system or, or you need a constant Internet connection. So you can specify the technology requirements in order to hire that employee in and have them purchase their own technology. That's, that's a great point, Bruce. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. And if I could add uh, kind of a, a backup question on that too, how about uh, security and, and the component of the technology and the home-based agent? Yeah, that's that's a that's another big topic and, and another hot topic that, that a lot of different people have 
uh, a lot of different opinions on. Uh, again, you want to make sure that uh, you are implementing a safe and secure environment for your customers, especially when you're dealing with PII, personally identifiable information, uh, with HIPAA laws and, and requirements. You need to make sure that uh, your home-based agents are just as secure as your in-office agents. But then again, you can you can turn back around, and who doesn't have a smartphone these days? And uh, you can have mm-hmm. – agents that are actually in the office and they have their screen up and they can take a quick picture of their screen. There's nothing you can do to avoid something like that. So security is definitely important. I'd I'd strongly recommend you work with both your your HR organization and and your um, privacy and security group within your organization to make sure that they understand uh, some of the implications of a home-based program and how you might want to implement technology to, to beef up security. Okay. Okay. Makes sense. Well, I, we've got one more question from Julie. She just sent me, um, and this kind of touches on what you mentioned earlier about uh, management styles and keeping the team together. So Julie asks, what's your most effective tool that you use to ensure collaboration between home-based agents? Good question, Julie. I'd say that there's two. Uh, the first is video conference. So Um, uh, there's nothing better than seeing someone uh, smiling at the beginning of the day or at the end of the day. And that same goes for your managers and and your employees. Uh, Webcams these days uh, are about $30 or $40. There's no reason why that should not be part of your technology stack that you roll out to your virtual agents um, and allow them to have virtual and video conferences with other agents and with their managers or supervisors. So video conferencing is huge, and it helps build that connection and that sense of community because you can see people, you can see them smile, you can react to them in ways that you can't do over instant messaging or email. So video conferences is one. The second one is is something you may not be thinking about, but an incredibly strong knowledge base. So again, when it goes back Mm -hmm. to collaboration and being able to peek over the cubicle to talk to another person that may have knowledge that you don't have, you need to try to replicate that through your virtual program. And having a strong knowledge base repository where agents can both apply knowledge that they've learned, but also go to seek knowledge is incredibly important to make sure that all of your agents are as effective and efficient as possible for your customers. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, I think there's nothing like having a great team and having great uh, sort of approaches to managing the team and also to have the repository of knowledge that everybody can dip into. So, uh, well, this has been great. I mean, we're, we've uh, uh, just passed our half hour. Uh, there, I think there's been more content packed into the last 30 minutes uh, than just about any show we've had. It's uh, really a lot of great advice and great insights. We've gone 360 degrees on this, Jesse, thanks to you. And uh, we've looked at the HR component, the selection of HR and management of them, the technology component, the techniques, uh, processes, Really, it's uh, been a great, great, great overview, and uh, thank you very, very much for uh, sharing those insights with us and with our audience. And uh, with that, uh, I'd like to hand it over to you for the last couple of words and then to Brian. Well, thank you very much, Bruce. I really appreciate being here. I'm, I'm already a big fan of the show, so I was very happy to be able to jump on and contribute, and uh, I look forward to future shows. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, back over to Brian. Yeah, Jesse, I do want to thank you uh, for being on the show today, but I have a a problem with your last answer, if you don't mind. Uh, The video conferences as a tool, does that mean that we can't wear pajamas anymore at home? (laughs) (laughs) Only pajama bottoms. <laughs> okay, good to know. Hey, good that's to what know. we and call that's what we call uh, segmentation. In this case, it's uh, you know clothing segmentation. <laughs> <laughs> right. hey, on a serious note, is there any studies that uh, indicate productivity being related to how people dress and you know how they feel about themselves, even though they're just still working from home? Well, you know, it always goes back to um, uh, you. You end up playing how you look. So you really want to make sure that you look your best. When you look your best, you feel your best. When you feel your best, you deliver your best. And at the end of the day, whether you're uh, in a sports program or uh, you know, you're, you're getting ready for a big rehearsal because you're in a music program, you definitely always want to look your best. And, and I'd say if you're working from home, uh, you still want to make sure that you feel successful to be successful. So I'd strongly recommend that no matter where you're working. 
Mm-hmm. That's good input. I guess I'm going to have to go uh, put on my suit now, Bruce. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Get out of those pajamas, will you? Actually, you know, it, it sort of brings up a, a, a thing. I, I'm uh, active in scouting as an assistant scoutmaster, and we went to uh, uh, Philmont, which is sort of Disneyland for scouts a couple of years ago. And uh, we were told that there were three rules. One of them is look good, right? Second rule is don't die. And third rule is, if you're going to die, look good. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, you, you, you want to feel your best, look your best, and uh, uh, I think that's great advice. Thanks very much for that, Jesse. You're welcome. <laughs> All right. Uh, Jesse, Bruce, thank you both. Uh, some wonderful food for thought for any of us looking at implementing a work-from-home program uh, and a lot of information that you can uh, – put into that decision that you might be making. So uh, at this point, uh, I want to also remind you to check our call talk shows in our archive section of our website, benchmarkportal.com. Many other great topics uh, that we've done over the last two to three years, so uh, please take advantage of that resource. I also uh, want to make sure you know that we do offer a free benchmark report. We call it a reality check benchmark report, and uh, it's a great way to see how your contact center compares to others in the industry based on some metrics that we'll ask you for and, uh, and compare. So From all of us, though, from Benchmark Portal, make sure you keep those headsets steady, your fingers ready, and looking sharp, whether you're home or at the office. This is Brian Karen, signing out. And that's a wrap. Take care, everybody.